Kujan B. Uh, my name is Kevin Anyango, uh, co-founder of Mtanda University uh, School of Soft Skills. The platform uh, talks about those characteristics that employers are looking for. Today, I am not alone. Today, I am with one and only Dr. Akombe. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin, and uh, thank you and, uh, for having us. And uh, really, congratulations for setting up uh, the Mutanda University School of Soft Skills. And uh, you know, these are the sort of things that we want young people to do and uh, to show that they, they can use the innovation and the technology to share experiences, uh, but also innovate. So really, congratulations for doing this. Oh, you're very kind. Uh, very kind words as well. I I've got to tell the viewers uh, that reaching you was really, really easy. So, actually, pull a queue and accessible. That is quite interesting. We human beings, no? <laughs> but, uh, Dr. Kombe, you know, I mean, uh, you're a very busy lady, uh, you know, very powerful job. Your personality uh, is admirable. So, you talking to me, I really don't take this for granted. So thank you for being here with us. And, and somebody asked me, and I'm not going to, I don't want to answer this question, but someone asked me, how old is that lady? But do not, ask, do not answer that. I'll go straight to the point. How is it working in the United Nations? Um, you know, I have worked with the United Nations uh, for almost uh, 16 years now. Uh, so that should tell you my age. <laughs> and uh, it is an organization really that um, I very much um, enjoy working with because of the values that it stands for. Uh, it is one that uh, strongly, you know, abides by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and really tries to, to promote issues of integrity, promote issues of, um, you know, humane, being humane in, in your, work, uh, your work life. And I think that's why when you mentioned that about accessibility, that is part, those are part of the values, my accessibility and my, how easily it was for you to reach out to me. It's really part of what we exemplify as the United Nations, the humility to understand that we are at the service of the people, that we are international civil servants, that you as Taxpayers, whether you are in the UK, Ghana, Nigeria, your governments pay the money that allow us to work with the United Nations. So we serve you. We are at your service. And so I think for me, that is one of the things that has always attracted me to the United Nations, that I represent all the 193 member states. I serve all the 193 member states without favorism. And so whether you're from Tonga or you're from the US or you're from Nigeria, uh, we see you as citizen of the world uh, to whom we serve. So, so, so for me, that's one of the things that really attracts me, the fact that we do not have national interest. Uh, we come without any national interest. We serve, the, we, we're there to implement the United Nations Charter to really go by what the United Nations was built for, really, which is affecting another world war, which we might majorly managed to avoid uh, doing this far. Thank you. Well, we we're talking about accessibility, and uh, my target audience are young people, or those people that look for employment or look for new opportunity. So actually, people like you are the ones working in the United Nations. So what will you tell young people that when, when they see job ad that you either UNTP Africa or uh, Walba Weber are looking for personnel. You don't need to know somebody there. You can just apply. That's one of the things that I have to keep emphasizing to people, that um, there is this perception that uh, for you to get a job somewhere, you have to know somebody. And if you don't know somebody, you're not even going to try. Or that you need to know somebody to reach out to Dr. Kobe. No, uh, just to say that the procedures uh, for uh, applying for positions in the United Nations Development Program, but also the United Nations in general, are very transparent. And um, and I would encourage people to put, put their names out there. You have nothing to lose uh, when you apply for a position. There's really absolutely nothing to lose. And so, don't let don't censor yourself 
uh, you know, but I'll, I'll have a very specific message actually to young women, because I see this all the time. When young women look at vacancies that are available, they will be the first to say, oh, but I don't have all these skills. On the other hand, the young men will say, we, we, we actually did a study about this. It was not just young men, but it was about men and women, whereby the male candidates would have, would look at a vacancy and they will say, ah, I have 20% of what is required. So I can apply for this job. The women will look at it and say, I have 80% of the qualifications, lack the 20%, so I will not apply. So to turn it around and say, the fact that you actually have 80% young women out there means that you can apply for the position. So go ahead and apply. Do not be the ones that censor yourself. Do not be the ones that look out and say, doubt yourself and, and feel like you, you're an intruder, that, that these, you don't belong to this place. Put yourself out there and let the other person be the one that says you don't meet the criteria. But as long as you have a bachelor's degree, that is all you need, by the way, to apply for a job in the United Nations. In many cases, when you have a master's degree, it's an added advantage. But actually what you need in most of our positions is a bachelor's degree. So do not, do not eliminate yourself. Go out there, apply. I did not know anybody at the United Nations when I applied for a job. I had nobody. I had no godfather, no godmother when I applied for the job at the United Nations. And here I am. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to ask this. Talking about you don't have godfather or godmother. When you worked for, uh, 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 for the Kenya's uh, Electoral Commission, did you have a godfather there, Dr. Kombe? I'm very proud to say that I have never had a godmother, never had a godfather. I have always put out my skills. Uh, by the time I applied for that job, I had to work with the African Union. I had worked with the United Nations on elections, um, on conflict prevention. I was absolutely highly qualified for it. So I did not need to have a godmother or a godfather for that. And as somebody who uh, you know, went in and got my PhD at a fairly young age when I was still in, in, in my 20s, uh, I made sure that, that I had all this, I met, I looked at the checklist of the jobs and wanted to make sure that whatever job people are going to look for, they're not going to have an excuse that, oh, we only have a master's degree, we're looking for a PhD, or we are, you know, we're looking for somebody who's, uh, who's, uh, who studied, um, you know, political economy and you only studied education. So, so it's setting, it's looking at the various skill sets that are available and equipping yourself so that people don't give the excuse to eliminate you from, from any position. So it's both, I see that your focus is on the soft skills, which is really important. Uh, but the soft skills have to be complemented by some of these, uh, you know, uh, basic requirements. And a university degree is now a basic requirement. Uh, and so you have to be competitive. You have to go beyond having your bachelor's degree. Get your master's degree when you can. Get your PhD degree if you can. There are lots of opportunities for scholarships that people don't take advantage of, especially at the master's and PhD level. It's harder to get scholarships at the bachelor's level. But as, at master's and PhD level, there are lots of opportunities that we don't explore. So, so just to say that the, the, the skills, the, the the technical skills are just as important as the soft skills. When we talk about academia, let's talk about personality as well. And uh, again, uh, lots of people, Dr. Kombe, uh, look, you and I were very lucky. You know, you are seated, uh, I think you're in Senegal now. I'm seated wherever I am. Uh, and people are like, oh, we are the fortunate ones. But uh, there is a, an element of personality when it comes to looking for employment or opportunities. Um, how important is that to you as a team leader? You know, do you look at academics? first and then personality, or does personality doesn't matter at all? I mean, first, as I said, uh, you have to meet the minimum requirements. Minimum requirements are academic qualifications. I, you know, I believe very strongly in, in, in building a team, in having people who can work in a team, who can work together in a team. And so having those personality traits, and, and, and it's not that 
they are inborn. A lot of these things you build them along the way. You build the skills along the way. You build this personality along the way. So I look at that very, very. You know, if I if I had two candidates that I'm looking, you know, that I'm, that I'm considering and I've been in positions like that, well, when uh, all the, the candidates that I have, it's two candidates who are both, you know, who both have a master's degree in political economy. Uh, what would make me choose one over the other would be really those skills. Are they able to work in a team? Are they able to, you know, do they have the um, emotional intelligence? You know, do they have it? Uh, you know, are they able to are they able to work on their own without having to be supervised all the time? I mean, those are the soft skills that I'm talking about. Those, that's what. Um, it really gives you an edge because, of course, we have when you're competing for the United Nations. One thing that I always tell people: I understand that by the time you are getting to be selected at the for position of the United Nations, you're the best. Uh, you know, because everything that is there is really among the very best. What distinguishes you is your soft skills. What distinguishes you from another person who has a PhD is really your soft skills, and that's where. I think we don't invest enough in, or we are not taught enough. You know, I look back at my time um, studying in Kenya, and, and 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 the things that I wish I had been taught, that I wish I had been, um, you know, uh, told that I need beyond. You know, that it's not just my my degree that will get me a job, that I needed to to build the ability to work with others, you know, that, that employers don't just look at my degree. Uh, but I was lucky, just like you, I was fortunate to have also then left Kenya to do my master's uh, program in the United States, where actually I think a lot of focus is paid on skills. And, and that's where I learned a lot of things in, uh, in, 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 in my various employment. So, so, so just to say that, I think it's something that I would, uh, I would consider very highly in whichever position I'm high on for. Now, how do you build this uh, economy? So, you, uh, uh, to be specific, uh, I'm doing, for example, critical thinking, uh, which employers are looking for, you know, people that can make decisions, you know, people that can make a stand. You say that they don't teach this enough in schools. So, uh, young people listen to us right now. What do you tell them? How do we build these soft skills that make us stand out? Critical thinking, I think, I think I would give credit to, to a lot of universities. They spend their time on that. Uh, at university level, the critical thinking part happens there because it's about also, it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily there at elementary school or you know, primary school or secondary school because it's rock learning. It's, it's, uh, you're cramming this because you have an exam. But, uh, but maybe during my time, things might have changed. Like, uh, as I said, I am old. Eh? So during my time at the University of Nairobi, actually, there was a lot of investment in critical thinking. Um, there was a lot of investment in making you look at different perspectives and different things uh, because we had radical professors who allowed us to do that. I know it's not necessarily the case right now, but I think it's really important because that's what helps you build your problems solving capabilities because uh, it's not the things that they teach you in university that you come and find in a normal workplace. Every time in a workplace, your judgment, your ability to, to make judgment calls is important because it's not necessarily, you know, it, 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 the scenarios that you do in school are not the ones that you will find in real life. The scenarios are supposed to help you have the skills to be able to solve problems. And I think for me, that's one of the things that I look at. I, 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 as a manager, I like to have my team come to me with, these are the things we are, to, we are crafting with, there's this situation, and these are the various options that we have. We can do this, we can do this, we can do that. And then I will okay, the various options. I am really impatient, and my staff will tell you, I will be impatient with anybody that comes to me and says, uh, Dr. Kumi, we have a problem. And this is the problem. And you throw the problem and leave it to me. No, that's not my job. 
That's why you are young and you have the brains. Your job is to think, what are the, give me the options. Then I can, we can look at the various, the three options. We can see which one will work, which one will not. We can, but, but you can't be the one, and, and you see this a lot in young people. Uh, you know, those are some of the soft skills I'm talking about. You've not been hired to identify the problem. You've been hired to identify the problem and troubleshoot and find, and, and find options and think outside the box. I think you, you know, my, my, my colleagues will tell you that anytime somebody comes with a brilliant idea, something that I haven't had before, like, wow, that's really good. You know, Baraka, that's excellent. Pizu, this is what we should go with. Ah, Nerina, I hadn't thought of it that way. So I think it's, it's everybody's always looking for brilliant ideas. And that's the, crit the critical thinking, the troubleshooting mindset allows you to do that. So don't, don't allow yourselves to be straight jacket. Don't, don't think that your supervisors want you to always say the things that are in the, within the box. Uh, you'll be surprised at how you will grow because people will know that this is the person to go, with, to go to when you want ideas, when you want to look at a, a problem differently and a solution to it. But, oh. but you get my gist. Dr. Akombe, you're very good with words. So are you telling me if you don't have uh, a degree, you cannot be a critical thinker? And I'm not... So let's forget about working at the United Nations. Talk just people that are looking for opportunities, uh, whether to be entrepreneurs or looking for employment somewhere else, not necessarily at the United Nations. So if you do not, uh, if you do not have a degree, you cannot have that scale of critical thinking. You cannot build it up. Absolutely, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I am speaking as somebody who has who has to hire people at the level of the uh, United Nations where the basic requirement is a bachelor's degree. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm dealing with. But I acknowledge that especially with the young population that we have in, in the continent in Africa, um, we need to invest much more in the technical, uh, the, you know, the TVETs as we call them, the technical level uh, training, because those opportunities exist there. I have seen some of, some of the most brilliant people that I have had to interact with are not necessarily people who have a bachelor's degree. So I'm not saying that formal education at degree level is what gives you critical thinking, absolutely not. All I am saying is that if you are thinking about working as, you know, picking a career in an organization like mine that requires you to have a bachelor's degree and above, then in addition to that, on up your other soft skills. Look at how you how you, you, you know, invest in reflecting a bit on emotional intelligence, which you don't need to be, to be trained for. You don't have to go to university. Nobody will ever teach you in university the skills that are related to emotional intelligence or judgment or things like that. There's no university that can teach you that. <laughs> or who's, whose fault is it that uh, most of people that be turned out from university may not have this kind of skills you're talking about. Is that a societal problem? Uh, is it a, a politician? Who, who's, whose fault is it? Or is it individual? But all I'm saying is that it's not, it's not true that all these skills are skills you have to learn at the university. I mean, emotional intelligence is not something that you can never go to, you can never have a program that you'll say, this is a program that is going to teach you on how to have emotional intelligence. All I am saying is that Society, as we grow, there are skills we pick, you know? the skills we pick, the things we learn. As a society, in places that we are growing up, right? And, and that the totality of a human being is not just about the education, the formal education system that they get. The totality of what makes me Rosalind Akombe is not, the, is not the university degree that I got from the University of Nairobi or Rutgers University. What makes me to be who I am are the various experiences that I've had in life, are the opportunities that I have had where as a young woman uh, in growing up in Kenya, I have learned to, 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 to have empathy by looking at what others don't have and how you know, it's by learning that uh, to, be, to be emotionally intelligent by understanding that there are things you can see instead, there are things you cannot say. You know, there are things you might have in your mind about how ugly somebody is, but I'm not going to tell the person they're ugly because, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, so the things that make me 
who I am is not just the university, it's all these other things in society that I have picked and emulating. You look up at somebody and you're like, ah, so that is how you would handle a situation like this. So it's the mentorship part that I've benefited from having very, very good, uh, powerful women around me over time that I have learned from. Uh, you know, it's the Karina Galax of the United Nations. It's uh, the Wanjiko Kabiras uh, when I was on the, the, the Center for Gender and Development. It's the Wangari Madais when we were pushing for, uh, against the, the, the grabbing of Karura Forest. You learn from these people. You learn from, you, you know, by looking at, you know, by looking at how they have handled different situations. Even bad ones, you learn. I know I, I had the advantage of working in the front office, you know, you know, like cabinet, like equivalent to a cabinet in the government. And so you at the United Nations, so you sit there and you watch how some managers make very stupid mistakes. And you say, when I grow up, I shall never be like that manager. So, so there are lessons you learn from both people who are mental and doing fantastic things, also people who you look at and you see, this is really bad. And you still learn from that and you say, I shall never be that kind of manager. This is the kind of manager I'll prefer to be. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. I mean, uh, your experiences are quite, are quite admirable. But this is unusual, Dr. Kombe. Is it not? I'm sorry? I'm saying the experience you're talking about, like, you know, uh, working, working uh, with uh, Dr. Wangari Madai, or looking at the way she used to work. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kabiru. These are quite personalities that are, it's not, my brother in the village will not have the opportunity uh, to work with the, uh, the William Mutungas or someone like you. So uh, what I'm trying to ask you is uh, practicality, okay? Someone from Bongo who is 18, I just finished high school, they're looking for opportunities. How do they build some of the personalities you're talking about here. Do they give up and just say, maybe I need to go to a good university, I may not have an opportunity to go to university, I may not have an opportunity to go to, uh, to go and do bachelor's degree. How do they build this kind of uh, skills at the grassroots level? Kevin, that's why I, I emphasized, I said that uh, learning skills is not just about going to university. Uh, I, I have to keep emphasizing that it's not, uh, and, and it's not just the soft skills that you need. You need more than the soft skills. The soft skills add to, to, to the technical skills that you have, you know? So let's say you, you go to, I don't know, um, Kenya School of Medical Studies, whatever, you know, you, you have your nursing degree, your, your nursing uh, a certificate, it's not a degree. But for you to be an effective nurse, you need more than, than, than that, 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 that document. Or um, you go to, to study carpentry, which is really important. I mean, how, you know, people are now buying. I don't know how much money I spend buying investing. If I see a nicely done table, I will spend all the money than going to buy something from, you know, I shall not say from which place. But, uh, but I'd rather just go and buy that nicely done table from this carpenter in Dunga, where I live. And, and it's nicely done. I can see that the, I know where the wood has come from. Uh, but for that carpenter to sustain the business that they have, it's not just about they need the technical skills of knowing how to make the table, but they also need the skills of customer service skills that will allow me to be able to, to then say, ah, you know, to encourage me and say, you know, oh, I've made the table, I can also do the chairs for you. Yes. And I can also do the other thing for you. It's, it is a thing that you learn from also society. And, and, and I, I don't want to give the impression that there is a school somewhere that you will go and you learn all these various skills that, you, you know, that today we are having a class in the, you know, the course 101 on emotional intelligence too, or, you know, it's, these are things that part and parcel of society that, that I think, and I, want to, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, that mentorship and learning from people, they have to be people with big names. I mentioned Karina Gallag, uh, whom you didn't ask me who she is. She's not a big woman. <laughs> she just happened to be my boss when I started working at the United Nations. She's not, you know, headline person. 
to somebody that I looked up on how she managed and, and I loved her management skills, you know, and, and I you know, get many things I've learned from her. Professor Wanjiko Kabira is not a name that you will see, you know, she's not, not a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She was a professor in the University of Nairobi. I owe who I am to be because she gave me the opportunity to work and I saw how hard working she was, how she mentored young women, you know, and, and she taught me the patience to deal with issues, so all these things. So what I'm saying for you to young people out there is that watch, look at how the people around you, there are things you will learn from what they do well and even things that you will learn from how they don't do very well. Even from the mistakes that people make, there's always something that you learn out of it. So, so don't give up, you don't need, I mean, I know that you do not need a university degree to make, to make it in life, you know? If you can get it, fine. But if you've been gifted, I have, I keep, I have two brothers who are engineers and I keep saying to them, I wish I was talented with doing things with my hands the way they do because I would make so much money, <laughs> but I don't. And so I admire their ability to be able to use both their brains and their hands to do a lot of things that I admire a lot. But I'm not able to do that because that's not where my skills are. So, so we all have something, you know. In, so for me, my motto is whatever it is that you're working with, be the best in it. Because it's only, you know, that's, that's how you move from one place to another, or even in terms of business, that is how you fund your business. If you make a nice table today and you present it very well, you have it uh, in, you know, in my house in Dunga, the next time I'm going to tell you to make you know, a cabinet, uh, you know? But if you are rude to me and you're, you, you know, you, you're not responsive, I call you to check on where you are with the table. I don't get any response from you, you know? Um, then I'm not going to come to you again. So, so I'm just saying that, uh, in everything that you do, you have to think about what, you know, what will encourage more people to work with you, uh, what will encourage more customers to come and get your services. But also, if you end up being employed, just think about what your employer is going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at, yes, your basic skills, which everybody already has, basic degree, which everybody will have. But what, what will differentiate you with the other person is really your soft skills. Wow. Dr. Akom, I can spend the whole day just listening to you. You are very, very good with words, I've got to say. I suppose they come with experience. Now, uh, before you leave, I've got to ask this. Um, uh, first of all, what many people do not know is that you do not just come from the public because of IBC. You used to be a leader at the University of Nairobi. Is that, is that correct? And those kind of experiences are what shaped you to be who you are right now. So what, what I'm trying to ask you is, how do you become a team leader? Or how, how, what a, how do you form yourself to be part of a team? So, in terms of, uh, uh, if you're talking about teamwork and, and, and becoming part of a team, uh, I think it's, it's, it's you know, I always form my teams based on comparative advantage. This person brings this, this person brings this so that so that you can then be able to deliver on something. So, so you must find your niche. You must find your niche. You must find the, the one thing that you're, you're, you're good in that you can contribute to, to the team. But in terms of how do you come out with leadership to become a leader? Uh, I think it's a mix. It's a mix of, um, of uh, being a risk taker. Uh, and it's also a mix of uh, just uh, whether you have the leadership skills or not. And we have to admit that it's not all of us that are meant to be. We don't, we are not all gifted in the same way. We, we, are, we have different gifts. And so I actually encourage young people to test out uh, what their leadership skills look like very early because then you know, you know, you know whether you can do that or not. And I think universities uh, and colleges uh, really form who we end up becoming. So if you're thinking about leadership opportunities in the future, it, leadership does not come uh, during your old age. It's either you, you, you develop it 
during your younger years and it manifests itself later or it's really not there. So feeling it from the very beginning at a younger age, I think for me is what, um, is what I would say. And, and you can see it even as a mother uh, bringing up my children and I have two of them. Uh, I can tell, you know, like you can tell who, who, who is, you know, of the two, this one is definitely going to go for this. And this one will definitely go. And so as a parent, you then figure out how do I support? How do I support in, in helping this one, shaping it towards, uh, towards this, this end, looking at the things that you can really see them having as, as children. And, uh, and, and sometimes leadership is also become special. I mean, we've seen people who have been pushed to positions of leadership because of that uh, that are there. And so there are times when it's been circumstantial that the, you know, the opportunity has come and people are able to see things about yourself that you didn't necessarily see and they push you towards those, uh, those positions of leadership. Wow. Uh, for those that have just joined us, uh, my name is Kevin Nyango, founder of Mutandao University School of Soft Skills. And today I was talking to Dr. Rosalind Akombe of UNDP Africa. Uh, last question for me, uh, Dr. Akombe. Is mentorship overrated? I actually don't think so. I think it's, it's not. Um, you know, I think we all, we, we as human beings, and COVID has shown us, COVID has shown us that we are social beings. Um, you know, we crave to have uh, the interactions with other human beings. And we don't crave to have interactions with other human beings for the sake of it. So, so I believe that there's, uh, there is something that you get out of, out of mentorship, out of coaching, um, and, and they can be formal mentorship programs, they can be informal mentorship uh, programs. At the United Nations Development uh, Program, for instance, we have a fellowship of, uh, for young African women. And, uh, and I can tell you that um, the first cohort that we had uh, that finished last year, I have seen fantastic women that have come out of that mentorship program because your eyes are opened to other opportunities that you might have seen. There is also, you know, there's a reason why even as a child, you will see a child, you know, very small, coming and dressing like uh, President Obama, you know, or they, they, they dress like Tina Turner, you know. Uh, I know you wouldn't know who Tina Turner is for your age. Tina <laughs> Turner. Oh, come on. <laughs> but, uh, but mentorship, role modeling is important. I mean, you know, for a long time, you know, you will hear people growing up like me who never saw any woman as a president. And so, Honorable Ngilu running as a president, like a presidential candidate, was big for us because it showed us that, ah, women can hold those positions too. You know, the women who are the young girls who are looking up and seeing, um, you know, seeing, uh, you know, Chief Justice come, the Chief Justice. They are able to look so, so it's more what what mentor, it's, it's both formal and informal ways of mentorship. So they're able to look and say, ah, so a woman can actually be a chief justice, you know, or a black person can be a president, or a, you know, a black person can be the head of the United Nations. So so I think the mentorship, both the formal one, which I've explained to you that we do within the United Nations Development Program, we just finished that fellowship. Uh, for you know, for the first cohort, we are just taking in a new cohort right now. I saw that I have a brilliant young woman who will be joining my team. So these opportunities for fellowship are important. And UNDP is invested in doing that. We are having a youth fellowship exchange that brings together now both men and female that we are just launching under the leadership of our sister secretary general, Abuna uh, Eziako. She's a big believer in youth and youth empowerment. So she's doing another continental uh, youth fellowship exchange program because mentorship and even peer-to-peer -peer learning is important. And so this is what this is who we are as UNDP. So we believe that those opportunities for fellowship, opportunities for mentorship, for coaching, but for informal settings like this one, so you might not see this as a, as a mentorship program, but I would see it the same way. There might be somebody who's looking out and saying, ah, look, Kevin, 
He's been able to put these mtandao universities full of uh, soft skills together and is able to do this. Or maybe I can try mine in French, or I can do a version in Portuguese, or I can do a version in Swahili. So you, even in your own way, you're mentoring without necessarily thinking consciously that you are doing mentorship. You're, you're very, very good at once. Listen, all this opportunity you're mentioning, the fellowship, uh, United Nations, uh, Africa, somebody asking, so where do you get this information from? The information is available. Uh, all the information related to the fellowship is available on our uh, on our handle, uh, our Twitter handle, which is at UNDP Africa. You can get it. You can get us on Twitter. We are also on Facebook as UNDP Africa. But we also have a very uh, broad website. Uh, you know, if you just go to UNDP.org and you check under Africa, you will find all the information there. But you can always follow me on Dr. Rosalina Kombe on Twitter, and uh, you'll find the information posted there. Wow, Dr. Kombe, uh, thank you so much for your time. And again, I've got to reiterate that uh, we've never met. Uh, you know, I know who you are, you don't know who I am, but uh, you responded to me, you gave me your contacts, and here we are now. Um, I cannot thank you enough for your time. Now, every guest, Dr. Kombe, who comes to this show, Actually, I've done over now 46 podcasts. And this is the very first podcast that, uh, uh, let me just get the stats right. So this is the very first podcast that during the show, it has been shared over 16 times. So clearly you are very, very popular. When are you going to be the president of Kenya? What was the question? When are you going to be the president of Kenya? I enjoy really working for the United Nations. I am, for now, I'm an international civil servant. I prefer working for all 193 member states rather than having one member state. So, so the answer is no. I'm sorry? So the answer is no, no, no not, not for presidency, for now. I said I enjoy working for the United Nations right now and the United Nations Development Program for Africa where we are really pushing issues of governance, where we really want to invest in young people, where we want to make sure that the recession, the democratic recession we are seeing in the continent is reversed so that uh, we can have, you know, the African people can have, uh, enjoy the natural resources that they have and, and really we see the Africa we want as, as, as uh, elaborated by the African Union. You're very, you're very, very good to answer questions. Look, I'm in your position. I'm going to ask this live. You can say no, yes, if you want to. Will you bring for me either Martha Karua or Dr. Komi, the Chief Justice? What was your question, Kevin? Can you bring for me either Martha Karua or Dr. Komi in this show? Well, Tunge Kando <laughs> is what I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, well, Aki Jamani, and really, really nice, uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Kombe. And listen, you cannot get rid of me now. Now I am your ally. I'm your friend, actually. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much and all the best. Thank you, Dr. Kombe. Thank you. Wow. Okay.